scale evolution. So we uh, decided to go to sort of very simple numerical scheme where we tie all these <coughs> rate of changes of all variables together and solve uh, a simple first order ordinary differential equation for mass radius, but now some more parameters. So in the, in the first model, I apologize for the missing x axis is the mass as a function of time. Hey. Um, and here the colored lines are the results of uh, the m body models, and the, the two lines are the uh, Emacs lines. And uh, there's, there's been a collection of models out there that look at something like this very, very accurately. But I think what is near in this model is that we get the radius evolution as well. Right? So here for these three same models, the evolution of the half mass radius uh, and then average over several simulations, and you can see that it's sort of expansion contraction phase is very well covered. Now this uh, uh, was assuming that clusters are very dense initially, so we can forget about this whole contraction phase. But if clusters are not dense, in terms of their half mass size compared to the Jacobi size initially, um, then you could actually lose a lot of mass uh, before the system goes into this balanced evolution where the cannot uh, uh, physics applies. So we have we had to do something to also model this and it's improved description for how the stars escape. Uh, we could uh, actually model that and also get some sort of reasonable description for how the core contracts. So now the model has the core radius evolution combined with half mass radius and mass. So this was uh, version two and um, because we're still dealing with equal mass systems, so we had to go one step further and do stellar mass models. This is something that came up this morning in the discussion. So stellar mass models is very peculiar uh, by chance, I think, uh, uh, dependence on, on the rate of change of the mass as a function of time, which happens to be such that it can uh, supply the energy that the cluster needs to evolve in this first expansion phase. And, and the reason is that the mass evolves roughly as a power of time. Right? And the mass of stars that lose mass, they sit in the center because of uh, mass segregation. So the mass that you take away from the center results in a relatively high change in energy. And this taking away binding energy from the center leads to, sorry, mass from the center leads to a relatively high change in energy. So I'll spare you all the details, but I'm happy to discuss that. I'll just show you this plot, the simulation where we include this effect of mass flux. This is the body model now. And I plot the quantity, uh, this, this dimension is quantity, the rate of change in the energy, but not, not the rate of change in the cost as a whole, but the energy supplied by mass loss. And so in this embody model, whenever a star explodes, I record how much energy uh, was being taken out of the model. And uh, if this is constant, uh, it, is, it is essentially supplying this, the right amount of energy for the cost. So what you see here is initially it's, it's way too much, right? So the rotation time is quite long. This energy supply is way too much for the cluster to, to conduct through the cluster. And I've done this the super Hanon evolution. Right? It's sort of super Eddington, but then for a stars. And then after a few gig years, uh, this becomes constant. And uh, this uh, is constant for a few, few more gig years, and only then the cluster goes to Right? And as more collapse, there's very little change here, apart from a few binaries are formed here. It's something I, I don't fully understand quite what the meaning of this collapse is in this model. But it starts to evolve like a post-collapse cluster already uh, here at 3 meters. Right, so stellar evolution can do a very important job in, in running uh, this cluster. So we have now, uh, the last version has, has this stellar evolution uh, also concluded. And just to uh, show an alternative version of the plot this morning, I think there was some confusion about the initial collision. So this is the plot I found in my archive. One of the things we first did is we have to compare to the Robinson's M4 model. And um, it turns out that if you plot again in the water plot, it looks much better. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I think it is also slightly close. And um, we fixed here the time radius of this model initially. We didn't fix the radius. I think there's a difference there. So we are on a different flexion degree with the same tidal radius. But the, the nice thing of this is it's so fast that we can iteratively search initial conditions. And this is an example of the uh, student uh, where you see here uh, sort of MCMC results, initial conditions based on mass and radius. Uh, and 
very generous, but at least you can explore this initial position space, and you can see how the different parts of the diagram contribute to the uh, final space. And I think it's really good uh, So finally, the last word, this is still in prep, but we've now taken an extra step and not uh, looking for the initial position of individual objects, but we're trying to constrain the sort of test diagram of the initial low cluster objects. Right? So the number of objects at every collection is very big, Every mass bin with some parameterized model, and then we're trying to constrain these, these power law shapes and, and this one. And, uh, most importantly, also to quickly show this one is still on prep, but uh, talking about uh, being right in the middle. So, this is the slope of the mass function of the progress, uh, and it's not zero, it's not minus two, it's minus one. It's right in between uh, the two extreme models that I was. So I'm going to leave with this, so one of the things we're working on right now is with uh, Oscar Eggers and the uh, student Toran, who now and Philippe are sitting here. Uh, we're going to try to connect this model into a more realistic part of the environment where it doesn't actually involve in a cosmological uh, context. Things may change drastically when we start doing that. Uh, I'm going to leave it for that. Thank you very much.
these accounting cores of potential. And it happens that it's quite important during galaxy mergers. So galactic tides on scale of star clusters they could have two effects. First, they can rub the cradle, they can help to form stars. And the second effect is to name the coffin by disturbing the, the star cluster. So the first part would be star formation working the cradle. So does this work? I would like to consider this uh, system, the antenna galaxy, the central region of these two galaxies interacting together to have one galactic disk almost face on here and one here, which I carry something like 60 degrees. And in this particular picture, you see that you have a lot of starburst activity. You have a burst of star formation in these regions. So you have a lot of star formation here in the nuclei. And you have been told in school that this is because of outflow. You have gravitational torques fueling the center of the galaxy. So the gas gets denser and denser. At some point, it forms a lot of stars. But you also have star formation in these regions, called the overlap region, where the two disks actually overlap. And in this particular region, you have the formation of young massive clusters up to 10 to 7 star masses, so a huge structure is there. Why is that? Well, since the two disks are overlapping in this area, in this volume, that could be just due to cloud collisions. We know that the collisions between clouds or between clouds and the gas reservoir of the other galaxy can trigger a lot of star formation. But I'm not sure they are frequent enough to explain such a star burst. Maybe, maybe not. This is something we have, we have to check. In any case, this does not ex ex uh, explain the formation of the star burst activity here. You are not in the nuclei, you are not in the overlap region, and still you have the formation of a lot of star, of massive star clusters there. Why is that? So, what, uh, what problem? If we summarize everything, we have a galactic interaction at kiloparsec or even more scales. And we have the effect, which is star formation at parsec, subparsec scale. What is in between? What is connecting the two? Well, I think it's reasonable to say that if you want to form stars, you need to, uh, to have the collapse of the giant molecular cloud. So this is one step left. What, is, what remains here? Well, I propose a scenario in which we have tidal compression, so tides involved, and turbulence also. Let me go back to this case, extensive as just compressive. And um, there is one nice aspect about that, is that if you consider interstellar media future, if you consider cloud, what will happen in these cases? What Shonda Jog did recently in her, in her papers is to rewrite the genes mass, including the table field. The usual genes mass, this one, does not take into account the table field, but the modified one does control the table field through this lambda parameter. Lambda is positive for extensive tides, negative for compressive tides. You clearly see immediately that in the case of compressive tides, you will get a modified genes mass which is smaller than the usual, the classical one. So this means that a less amount of gas is stable against collapse, so in other words, it's easier to form stars. So if you have compressive tides, you probably trigger more easily the formation so this, in, in very late, in extensive time, you will stretch your cloud. In compressive time, you will compress it and maybe have to the point that you will reach densities high enough to form stars. So what is the connection with galaxy mergers? In this very naive simulation of the antenna galaxies with just stars and dark matter, no higher than this yet, I'm showing here in red the region which are in this tightly compressive field. And you see that the uh, the deadlock during the during the merger, you have an increase a few million years before the collisions, before the pericentral passages, and these cover huge volumes like that. And the, the, the nice thing about this conclusion is that they are valid for all kinds of mergers. So of course you change the, the absolute value that you have always an increase of this compressive tidal field over a large volume, whatever the mass ratio of your galaxy are, whatever the orbits, whatever the the shape of the dark matter halo you will always have these points. How do you compute this compressive tides? Sorry? How do you compute them? Uh, what we do is to look at the slope of the acceleration in the space. So the first variety of the acceleration in space, which gives you the 
table to get the table tensor with nine components, and you diagonalize the, the table tensor, you look for the size of the three eigenvalues, and you are only getting your input resistance. Do you have a good physical picture of when you get an aggressive tie? Yes. Can you explain? I'm sorry. Do you? I said, do you have a good physical picture of how you get an aggressive tie? In, in the, where the potential is a core. Since the, the table field is the first derivative of the iteration in the second derivative of the potential in space. So when it's a core, you're saying? Yes. When it goes flat? Yes. Well, well that's not flat. It can be a core without being flat. I mean, the core is opposite the cusp. So if you have a cusp with a direction, you get a positive type uh, of field, so an extensive one. If you get a core, you get a one with flat. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Like uh, in, in the central region of the plumber sphere, for example, it's It's in the central region of a what? Plumber sphere. Plumber sphere. A plumber sphere. Yeah. But, so but you don't have to go very far out before it becomes yes, yes. destructive, right? And this is why it's nice in Russia, because of just the fact of overlapping these two potential. Yeah. Even if you overlap top cusps, you get more resistance. You create force. I, I know that. So uh, if, you, if you overlap, for example, two NFW profiles, which are cusps in the center, you get right. Uh, time. But by the time you get to the sort of the uh, half mass radius type of thing, you know, where the radius can start to change, <coughs> yes. you actually uh, very quickly you get you can disrupt it. Yeah. Oh, but he's seeing things that are well off the center, so it's like right there, it's all the way out to the right. You can yeah, you can convert several to a passing. Yeah, are you saying that this gives you a comprehensive view of star formation and merger? Sorry? Are you saying this gives you a compliment? compliment I mean, to so, um, so we have this compressive type index in mergers, and uh, we wanted to check if there is a direct relation to star formation. Because here we, we don't have star formation, we just have the representation of the potential. So to check the connection with star formation, I ran a new model of the FC, so more or less the same orbit, but this time is gas. So you see two galaxies interacting together, creating this large tiny tail, 100 kilo per sec long between the two. We have a pretty good match with the observations in terms of morphology and also kinematics. And if I look at the central region, I put the gas on the left, moon stars on the right, so stars form during the simulation. You can see the star burst activity by high. You see that many, many stars are formed during the encounters. So here I give a technical detail of the simulation. And thanks to the simulation, we can measure whatever we want and try to uh, understand how star formation of the star burst activity is working. So we get this galaxy interaction, we get this stable field, which is acting on kiloparsec, 10 kiloparsec scale. And we want these to have an effect on subparsec or sparsec or subparsec scales. So we need a process that is uh, taking this energy and make it cascade down to very small scales. What kind of process is doing that? It's turbulence. It's a very quick summary of turbulence. If you have a local velocity field, you can somehow decompose it with three components. The net motion, which is more or less average of the velocity field. The solenoidal turbulence, which is a kernel of the velocity field, so it's a mixing effect. And the compressive turbulence, which is a divergence of the velocity field. So if you decompose your fields like that, you can reconstruct the uh, Full velocity field. So turbulence are two modes, solid and compressive. In usual setup, without forcing it, and this is the energy distribution between the two modes. You get two thirds of the energy in solid mode, but it's a mixing effect of two degrees of freedom, and one third is compressive because you, have, when you only have one degree of freedom. So this is the case in usual galaxies. What is happening in merger? Well, here I put the energy fraction between the two modes, so you know, in blue, compressive in green, as a function of time uh, along the merger. So at the beginning, you more or less have two thirds, one third, and as the merger, the collision proceeds, everything changed. A few million years before the first passage in two modes uh, exchange, the, the compressive one becomes the dominant one. The, oscillate a little bit, and at the end, when you reach final coalescence, when you are back to isolated galaxy moments, then you are back to the normal stage, you are back to the uh, usual uh, setup. 
So you see with that that the, the very interaction between the two galaxies is completely changing the nature of turbulence. All of this connects to the tides and to the star formation. Well, here I will plot the emission of time of the mass fraction in compressive tides. You see you have these peaks connected to the horizontal passages between the two galaxies. This is the energy in uh, compressive turbulence. And this is the star formation rate. So you see that the three quantities are more or less the same behavior with a little shift, a little delay here in time. So we get this sequence, tight turbulence star formation rate, star formation rate, with a delay, a total delay between 10 to 30 million years, in indicating that the large scale uh, trigger from the tides due to the collision and the compressive tide is uh, changing the nature of turbulence which propagates to the star formation. So uh, this could explain why the star cluster and why star formation in the interacting galaxy is so different than in the, in the isolated galaxy. So we have compared with our previous simulation of the Internet galaxy here, where I put the mass and half mass radius of the cluster that we found, and these are that we, the one that we found in the Internet. The they are a little bit larger, but this is not really significant, they are quite close to the resolution limit but they are much more massive. And you can reach even unrealistic masses for the MTN of 10 to the 8, because you are in the regime of ultra-compact dwarf galaxies. And this is because you have changed the nature of turbulence due to the compressive tides. Another point that I would like to mention is that if you have a strong compressive turbulence, you create, at the subparsec uh, scale, you create a lot of cores, but massive and large cores. And these cores will be the protostellar cores, so they will form probably more massive stars. And if this change in the turbulence induced at large scales propagate down to the scale of the cores, that you cannot prove but it's possible, then you change the IMF. And you will get the top heavy IMF in, uh, in galaxy mirror. Okay, so to summarize this first part, major galaxy merger have one channel for the formation of the Black Cluster. This is not the only one Mark also mentioned formation in high red sheet galaxies. Um, the nice thing is that merger occur at low and high red sheet across cosmic time, so you have this effect in very different uh, configurations in very different uh, type of galaxies. You can form a blue cluster across cosmic time. And the question that we would like to understand is that do we do this blue cluster survive the following merger of the history of the galaxy. So to study that, so the second part, meaning the coffin, what we want to do is to look at the evolution of the star clusters in this complex tidal field. So the acceleration felt by a star and star cluster is internal gravitation to the cluster, differential acceleration due to the tidal field, and these nasty terms due to the motion of the cluster itself around the galaxy. To simplify the equation, I will put myself in the reference frame of the galaxy so that I, get, get, I can get rid of the uh, centrifugal Coriolis regular terms. I still have uh, the internal orientation for the cluster and the differential acceleration for the tides. And I rewrite this equation using this mathematical trick that I just mentioned uh, to you. Know, the tidal tensor, which is the second space derivative of the potential. Thanks to this and tidal approximation, I can rewrite my equation like that. And I have only two terms. The first terms, I can compute it using a simulation of the galaxy, for example, the MTD galaxy, but also in this galaxy or whatever galaxy I want. I just follow one particle, it's supposed to represent my star cluster, and I compute the tidal tensor along the orbit. I store this information into a file, and then I can Concentrate on the second term, the internal gravitation for the cluster, and this obviously I will get from the simulation of the star cluster. So two steps, two simulations, and I will make the, the two talk to each other. So to make the simulation of star cluster, we are using MW6 um, and the GPU version of it, which provides us with this internal acceleration, and for the rest of the equation, it's very simple. We use the information that we store in this external file. 
So we just have to send the two contribution and see some by the patch 36 or the 36 TT, which is available online if you want to play with that. And we have used this code and 6 TT to look at the effect of a merger <coughs> into a population of star clusters. So what we have done is we have considered a lot of star clusters of different, uh, different parameters, shape, mass, number of stars, densities, etc. And we have, we have put them on several orbits in the merger. So we have run more than 700 standard simulations like that. So not very massive star clusters, but uh, with a wide diversity in their parameters. And here I'm putting the evolution along time of the mass of the full population. So it's an average, it's not representative of, of star cluster, but representative of the population of star cluster. So first, without ties, I just had the two-body relaxation that makes my stars state the cluster, uh, not being bound anymore to the cluster. So this is why you have this slow evaporation of the cluster. Next, I consider one disk galaxy. I have the additional effect of the stable field, so the distribution is accelerated like that. And next, I consider the intelligence, so say this plus another one, interacting together. Here I have to tell about two subpopulations. The first are clusters injected into the table tails. At the beginning, the field is much different from the previous cases, but when you create the table tail at the first very central passages, that's actually, you eject your cluster into this uh, weak type of field, and so the evolution is slowed down considerably. The second subpopulation are clusters staying in the central part in the remnant, or maybe being ejected but falling back rapidly. In that case, once again, not much difference between before uh, and the, the early stages. And after that, when I get the, uh, the strong effect of the two gags and the gags merger that combine to get uh, accelerated dissolution. So you can see that within one galaxy with only one interaction, only one merger event, you can have a very different behavior between the two, uh, the two populations. So to conclude, I'm showing here the simulation of two star clusters, very few stars so that you can see uh, rapidly their evolution. That I put on two orbits, one in yellow, one in red, here on this galaxy, and the other galaxy is coming to build the antenna galaxies. At the beginning, you cannot really tell apart the difference between the two clusters, initially they are exactly the same, only the orbit is changed. And at some point, you will get the first collision. And if you look at the star cluster, the first collision, there is nothing happening. You cannot see uh, any effect no direct effect of the galactic collision. But you see that one cluster is being ejected, one cluster is staying more or less in the central region, and after a few, uh, few hundred million years, few billion years, you can start to tell about the two. And you see this indirect effect of the galaxy interaction, that by changing the orbit, you change the tidal field in which the star cluster is evolving, and therefore you change the distribution rate. And you see that this cluster is only quicker than this one was in the yellow orbit and this one was on the red orbit. So um, the, the project that I've uh, pre presented uh, on Monday is to use more the same method, but in the case of compressive ties that you have in the dwarf galaxy, so this will follow more or less the same approach with a limited amount of uh, uh, simulations. Limited amount of to summarize the role of galactic type on star clusters, you have the tidal compression in, in interacting galaxies, in any kind of interacting galaxies, inducing turbulent compression, and these cascade down to the small scale leading to an announcement of a star and maybe star cluster formation. Once the cluster is formed, uh, the, ne the next merger <coughs> are very visual effects, only an indirect effect by changing the orbit of star clusters, but nothing really happened at the collision itself. Okay, so it seems to me that you're using these compressive trot ties as a proxy for star picture, which is pretty crude. It's not a proxy, just another effect. In, in, the, in the first incident that I've shown, with, uh, I have no star formation at all, I have no gas, 
currently, we are just looking at the shape of the permission. We have, if I have core, I have this permission. It has nothing to do with star permission, but it can trigger star permission. Well, sure. Okay, but you're effectively you're using that as a mechanism to yes, trigger the Sure. So it's kind of the same thing. So, and, you know, it's, kind of, it's a pretty crude representation of what the processes would lead to some of the Now, very Bellotto, Mark Pumpkins, and others have worked at the detailed attendance on things like publicity, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. shielding, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And so it might be interesting to see if you use a range of different mechanisms for your extrapolation description instead of just the types of ties, how that affects the distribution of the surface. I'm absolutely not saying that the only way to constant is to composite things. That would be crazy. I'm just saying that one way, and to my knowledge, the only way for those of now to explain the six times. Star process, management of star formation activity is through competitive science. Of course, all the processes I've mentioned, the dependence of the data field, the phase, feedback, the density, all these things, is occurring even in this competitive field in many cases, and these have to combine to create a full picture. But this is just an additional effect without which, in my theory, you cannot explain star formation in this extended uh, region. At least such a purpose. I don't dispute about uh, confessional rights. I've used it myself in the past. Uh, then about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But wouldn't you expect this also to happen just from caustics, even without tides, right? I mean, uh, you, know, you see this kind of caustics uh, without dark matter, or just because they all get stretched out. It's mm -hmm. a it's a kinematic process. It's not a uh, quasi hydrostatic process. The tides, you know, it's, uh, it's a, a good concept if you're already in some sort of a quasi hydrostatic equilibrium. You get a little bit more compression and then that makes a difference. But this whole process is very, very dynamic. Yes. Yes. Right? So if you have caustics, you get just as much density and hydrostatic, if not more, than the compressional tides. Well, but he's got both, because you're doing a hydro You've got both. The, yes, yes, the, yes. Because, I mean, presumably you also see more stars but in the region between the galaxies, where there isn't mm -hmm. anything. Yeah, yeah, but you yeah, don't, so you have to see yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is the caustics will exist right. without the compressional time. You can yeah, do yeah, it yeah. even yeah. without yeah. that region, right? Well, I mean, in Milky Way, yes. almost all the stars formerly not from the time. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But you guys can check this, right? Because yes, yes. you know where the compressive gap uh, Tides are, you just turn off the gravity. Mm -hmm. No, no, you just change the slope, that's all. You don't need to turn off the gravity, you just need to change the slope. The slope of what? The slope of the potential. We, we well, still need some kind of gravity. Yeah, you don't, don't need to, you, don't, you change the slope of the potential, that's it. We, we are we're working right now on the resolving, especially the region where the tides are. And, uh, no, but yeah. I think what Doug and I are both suggesting is that you can, you can moderate the gravity in those yeah. regions. Right. Exactly. To change it so that it's no longer compressive. Yes. And then this is a very uh, crude comparison between the absorption and back and the region of the compressive effects. I just put the contours of the type of compressive in this pattern of shape, in the overlap, and in this field. So what my concern is that that concept relies on almost a virilized system already happening. But the system is not virilized. It's, it's not relaxed. Okay, see, yeah. You have the galactic yeah. type. When you write, you put a contour, you can see it right away. It's not uh, uh, spherically symmetric. The system yeah, is course. evolving. So then, you know, the uh, this, uh, potential is evolving as fast as the orbit is changing. But the compressive types are, are acting on these scales, not the scale of the JCs. This is why you need to the turbulence to propagate it. Yeah. 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 Yes, we yeah. can discuss this out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
the two lectures will be upstairs again tomorrow morning. One of them will be a short one lecture. What do you think of this room? Is it better or worse than upstairs? Better. Better? Okay, so let me stay here. observing the central part of a Glover cluster, since we know that IFU are used and uh, nicely working for unresolved stellar system, but what are the limitations that uh, are there for applying IFU to unres to resolved stellar system like Glover cluster? So the question is, are we really understanding what the data are telling us before concluding if, I am, uh, if intermediate mass platforms exist or not exist? I have some preliminary results. If you want the answer to this question, come and talk to me.
with Kelly Holly Hoffman. Um, the poster I'm presenting is on our work on galaxy flyby interactions. So unlike merger interactions, the galaxy flyby, the two galaxies interact and it goes to ways never to come back. Um, and so cosmological simulations by a uh, postdoc of Kelly's uh, Manavi Sina have shown that flyby interactions are actually very common at low redshift and more common if not compared, or comparable if not more common than mergers. So they actually could play a very important role in galaxy evolution. And so in order to understand this role, we're doing simulations of these interactions. Um, and so the poster is on our first set, which is just three interactions um, of prograde one to one, prograde 10 to one, and a retrograde one to one interaction. And specifically, uh, this is the topic of a uh, paper that was just accepted. And uh, we find that we can actually form bars during these interactions. And so this may have important consequences for the bar fraction that we observe in regions where we expect to have many flybys. <laughs> and so if you want to um, actually see my plots and <laughs> talk, talk to me a little bit more, uh, come see my poster. We managed to fit everything on a single, on a single slide for us, just so it can show you a short movie, but which is not really related to what I will present, but it's nice anyway. So just to, to give a context, so we are sitting in the dynamic in the graphic center, where star are nearly Kipperian. The dynamics that is really different from two-body two -body interaction. The ability to write a plan for two-body interaction is, is a, based on three major assumptions. We assume that the interactions are local, that the process is more covert, so interactions are independent of each other, right? And, and we assume uh, the interactions are weak. So, so the, the effect is a cumulative interaction of small angle reflection, and then the certain limit can be applied, and we can write a, a focal plan equation, which is local in time, and, and uh, have only two diffusion coefficients. In such a system, this is very different because here we have extended objects, so the interaction is not, is not local. There are, there are a long-term correlation because, because the system is almost fixed and the potential is almost fixed. Okay, and we have really separate time scale because, for example, the star can process due to, 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 um, to a GR uh, precession, so we have a separation of time scale. So, can we write a focal plan equation for, that, for such a system? And uh, if, if you come to see my poster, I will show you how, how we can actually do that. But I will just show you a short movie that demonstrates the compli complicated behavior of the secondary system. So... Is that a black hole? Is that a black hole? Yeah. It's for the inside of the black hole. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> It does have hair. It does have hair. Okay. So what we see here is is the n body system made out of circular rings which interact with each other. Okay? Each point of the sphere is the normal a vector to the ring, okay, and, and they are present in a 3D sphere. The color is is the the, the um, same major axis of each orbit. So similar color and and and, and points which are close to each other will interact strongly. So you can actually form some some kind of binary. Okay. You can see the, the circular motion that, that on short time scale the evolution is almost linear. Okay, you have this 
binary, which are almost separate from the cluster. Okay, that is it. Thank you.